Okay, after graduating from UNC in 1964 with a degree in journalism, Jim has served as a U.S. Air Force Public Information Officer. Following his military service, he edited New Vistas, a quarterly magazine based in Miami. In 1973, he joined the Smithsonian Institution and served as the director and curator of imaging and photographic services, supervising photographers in the National Museum of American History, the National Museum of Natural History, and the National Air and Space Museum. He retired in 2003 and continues his photography, concentrating now on nature and wildlife, as well as newsmakers at the National Press Club, where he's a member. Okay, without further ado, join me in welcoming another a four, classmate of 1964, Jim Wallace. Thank you very much. Let, let me begin by saying that uh, some of the photographs taken during the period uh, that we're going to be talking about are up here, and I just wanted to say in the beginning that all of these photographs were taken for the Daily Tar There were going to be four of us here. Gary Blanchard, who was co-editor of the Tar Heel in 63-64, uh, called me two days ago, and he has a back problem and is seeing a doctor and couldn't make it. And so we will try to fill in for him as well as we can. Um, Fifty years ago, this was a campus facing great change. Questions of who could eat where, who could speak on campus, made impacts that have lasted till today. All three of the panel today were staff members of Daily Tar Heel. And so we saw recorded, the recorded, and photographed the dynamics of these changes as they were taking place, and have been asked to talk a little bit about them today. And let me introduce the other two. Mickey Blackwell, formerly known as Dr. Michael C. Blackwell, <laughs> is now CEO of the Baptist Children's Homes of North Carolina, a position he has held for the past 31 years. The Baptist Children's Homes have 33, 23 facilities in 19 different communities across North Carolina, and last year ministered to the needs of more than 1,200 children. He's written five books and serves as a motivational and keynote speaker when time permits. 50 years ago, he was a reporter for the Daily Tar Heel. Karen Parker was the first black female undergraduate to attend Carolina, and as a former member of the UNC GAA Board of Directors. She enrolled at UNC in 1963 and was a student journalist and civil rights act activist. She fought against discrimination, was jailed for her participation in sit-in, and after graduation and more recently, she served as copy editor for the Winston-Salem Journal after holding editorial positions for newspapers including the Grand Rapids Press and the LA Times. Two years ago, she was inducted into the North Carolina Journalism Hall of Fame. 50 years ago, she was a reporter for the Daily Tar Heel. I'd like to make, we're going to, we're going to begin with Mickey, who is going to talk um, primarily uh, about the speaker ban and the effect that it had on the campus 50 years ago. And I will just add in advance just in case he doesn't mention it, some of the photographs that you see up here from the Ku Klux Klan rally, Mickey was with me that night when those were shot. Mickey. Well, it was a day that began like any other day, but it ended 
in a day that had ominous implications for Chapel Hill and for those of us who were students that year in the tumultuous 1963-64 academic year. June 25th, 1963, a group of men, white men, conservative white men, gathered at the epicenter of political power in Raleigh. No, I'm not talking about the legislative building. I'm talking about the Sir Walter Hotel. <laughs> right at the end of Fayetteville Street, this was where the legislators all lived when they gathered to make laws. Some of those laws had their beginning in some of the little catwalks and some of the little places off to the side at the Sir Walter. Now, everybody at this time was tired. It had been a long, arduous legislative session. And those men had become somewhat concerned, if not agitated, about some of the faculty at Chapel Hill showing some allegiance and sympathy to people who wanted to march, desegregate, and integrate. What could be done about that? At that agitation that took place late on the night of June 24th and early on the morning of June 25th, some of the people got together there in the Sir Walter Hotel and said, We've got to do something, we've got to do it quickly, we've got to do it expeditiously, and we don't want anybody to know about it. And that's what they did. The Speaker of the House, Clifton Blue, got together with the President of the Senate, Clarence Stone, and they enlisted a member of the House, Phil Godwin, and they said, we want to do something, and the way that we can do it is to introduce a bill which needs to become law this very day, which is going to keep certain people from speaking at our universities. Read, keep them from speaking in Chapel Hill. There wasn't a great deal of concern about what would be going on at the university, women's college, women's college, later you went see Greensboro. Not a great deal of concern about what would be going on at the third branch of the Consolidated University in Raleigh, but Chapel Hill, that was altogether a different matter. And so, in the waning moments of that day, that legislative session, an act to regulate visiting speakers at state-supported colleges and universities was introduced. Very quickly, without discussion and without prior notice, it passed the House. And in those days, all you really had to do was take a walk down the legislature and go into the Senate. The word came. It needs to pass. It needs to pass quickly. Only a handful of those who were supporting this legislation even knew about it. Five, six people at most. And so it goes over into the Senate. There, the president of the Senate, a very hard-line conservative named Clarence Stone, starts to preside, and there was one person who uh, rather meekly raised his hand to protest it, and he was interrupted by the president of the Senate, Clarence Stone, and said, you know, I believe that this is a good bill, and it needs to become a good law, and we need to do it right now. Others wanted to speak. Clarence Stone took his glasses off and looked out and said, I see no one else ready to speak. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye, the ayes have it. Done. The bill became law. A few minutes earlier, the telephone rang in William Friday's office. It even seemed to have a kind of urgency to it. Bill Friday went and picked up the phone. President Friday, you need to get to Raleigh immediately. And he ran to his car, and maybe one of the few times in his life, he broke the speed limit going down 54 to get to the legislative building too late. That bill had become law. Three readings 
in five minutes. <laughs> it was known ominously as the gag law. That's how it was called here in Chapel Hill. It became more or less known as the speaker ban law. And it had immediate implications for Chapel Hill. And although there was not necessarily a great hue and cry across North Carolina, I kind of took it on myself to make sure that what was happening in Chapel Hill needed to be reported out. And fortunately, I had a large venue with which to do that. The Charlotte Observer had asked me to become, my senior year, their Chapel Hill correspondent. I was also doing that for the Raleigh Times, the now late defunct Raleigh Times. And so I had a venue beyond even that of the Daily Tar Heel. And much of what I reported on the speaker band law found its way into print, big time print, sometimes on the front page, often as the lead story on the state front about the speaker band law. Now one would think, rightly so, that there would be reaction on Chapel Hill's campus, and there was. And some would even think, is the reaction going to be with the president? Is it going to be with the chancellor, or should it be with the faculty? Well, there was a reaction with the faculty here, but in some cases it was a little bit tepid. Not exactly what certain people thought should be the reaction to what had happened in Raleigh on that ominous day of 25 June 1963. And it was just a few months later, October 12th, which you know as University Day, the Pulitzer Prize winning author Paul Green was the speaker for University Day. He lived here in Chapel Hill. I saved a whole slew of articles that I wrote for the Charlotte Observer. Faculty has mixed reaction on acceptance of gag law. This was October 15th in The Observer. By Mickey Blackwell Observer, Carolina News Service, University of North Carolina faculty members had mixed reactions Monday to a weekend speech in which Pulitzer Prize winning author Paul Green of Chapel Hill accused them of not speaking out against the so-called speaker gag law. I asked him to clarify this, and this is what he said. Professors and researchers are busy discovering and searching for truth, but they do darn little, I think that's the word he used with me, they do darn little to see if that truth prevails in our society. The teachers here should be on the public firing line. They are the men who have the knowledge, then they should try to see that it is used for the, for the benefit of the society in which they live. Now, some of the faculty had reactions to what he said, and one of them was Arnold Nash, who was chairman-elect of the local branch of the American Association of University Professors. Mr. Green cannot prove that the faculty is not doing something about it. What he means is that the faculty isn't making a great noise about it. Now there was another professor named Gordon Cleveland, some of you had him for poli-sci, Orange County Commissioner agreed with Green. I think that most of us will probably agree that there has not been much of a cry from the faculty, but there has to be a certain amount of political strategy involved in something like this. Well, it's very interesting that soon after Paul Green admonished in such a public setting as University Day that the faculty met. And the Charlotte Observer gave us this headline, UNC faculty stands against speaker ban. This came just a few days after Paul Green's speech. Opposition unanimous in the council. Resolution will go to trustees by Mickey Blackwell Observer Carolina News Service. <laughs> Just in case you forget. <laughs> University of North Carolina faculty members spoke out strongly for Academic Freedom Tuesday by joining to oppose the law banning communist speakers. 
The 75 member faculty council in a closed door meeting voted unanimously to oppose the Speaker Van Law in a resolution. I tried to find out what it was. All I could find out was that it was strongly worded and designed to, quote, educate rather than agitate. That's political. And that's significant. And that was real. Sources said the faculty council's draft is about four typed pages drawn up by a seven-man committee headed by Dean Henry Brandis of the law school. And just in case you don't know, the Speaker Van Law, enacted in the closing session of a 1963 General Assembly, forbids speakers to talk in state buildings if they are communists or have pleaded the Fifth Amendment in response to questions about communist affiliations or activities. Well, there was a lot of discussion back and forth as to who was going to support the Speaker Van Law, who was going to oppose the Speaker Van Law. Here's a speech I covered by Assistant Attorney General Ralph Moody. He upheld the Speaker Van Law here in Chapel Hill, saying, quote, the state does not have to provide a forum for those who would destroy the state. Moody speaking, give him credit, to a group of university faculty members in Chapel Hill said the law was constitutional because the state had jurisdiction over the university and that freedom of speech, quote, is not applicable to those who advocate communism, no matter how skillfully the doctrines may be cloaked and disguised. Well, so much for that. Then the man weighed in. The man in this case was William Brackley Acock. We knew who he was, and we were very thankful then, and particularly looking back, that we had this man who was fearless. And as some of us heard in the seminar yesterday, he knew how to work with a man who was president. And even though they had been in study groups together, the one great thing about Chancellor Acock is what he didn't want to be president. He knew who the president was, he knew who the boss was, and he knew what he could do and what he could not do. But at that time, Bill Acock became the point man. And I think when he spoke on a day much like this one, to the Alumni Council, he was ready to go. I remember this meeting, it was in the Moorhead Planetarium. And again, the Charlotte Observer had this headline on Sunday, November 10, 1963, over line headline, William B. Acock, UNC Chancellor calls red gag law insult. Now I'm gonna read a little bit of this to you. And I'm going to read it with some kind of dramatic license here, although it's going to be absolutely directly from the article by Mickey Blackwell, Observer. <laughs> <laughs> University of North Carolina Chancellor William B. Acock launched a blistering attack upon the Speaker Gag Law Saturday. Now, if you know Bill Acock, you can... You, you can know he could be like a fanny rooster sometimes, calling it a stigma, an insult, and a limitation upon higher education. Only the legislature has the power to get rid of this unfortunate stigma, Acock continued. The only power we have is the power of education to show the people and the legislature the tremendous harm in this bill, and of course, it takes time for such an educational power to assert itself. Speaking at the annual meeting of the UNC Alumni Board of Directors, Acock cited the law as being, quote, full of ambiguities and calling it the sloppiest bit of legislation that I have ever seen or heard of, quote, it was also the poorest drafted legislation that I have seen and is the most serious challenge for the university 
since the monkey bills of the 20s, he said. The monkey bill prohibited teaching Darwin's theory of evolution. It never passed. I wanted to say, tell us how you really feel about this, Chancellor Aikon. <laughs> Quote, people who have taken the Fifth Amendment can speak on the campus irrespective of what they talk about. I love this. They can speak on the steps of the post office or in Chapel Hill High School, but no, they can't speak on campus, ACOP continued. My emphasis there on no, but I can almost hear him saying, you can speak here, but you can speak there, but you can't speak on campus. People who have taken the Fifth Amendment direct quote, can speak in these places but not here. This was supposedly, he says, to meet an evil that was supposed to exist. But, he continues, I can assure you there was no need for such a law. There is no evidence on any of UNC's three campuses to indicate any need for such a law that takes basic fundamental rights from the university. Acock says the legislature passed a huge appropriation of $2 million for the research triangle to give scientists a favorable environment in which to work. Quote, but then the legislature turns right around and says you can't have this favorable environment. It is just as if this appropriation had been washed down the drain. My respect for and admiration for Chancellor Acock really went high. He kept it going. Now this article was dated November the 10th. Our world and the world changed on November 22nd. And a lot of the discussion about the speaker ban law began to cease. Now, when we graduated, it was also the time when Chancellor Acock decided he was going to go back into teaching in the law school. And some have already talked about what a dramatic impact that was on their lives. The chancellor that came after Bill Acock didn't know much about Chapel Hill, didn't know anything about the speaker ban law, Paul Sharp. We don't even hardly remember his name. Believe it or not, he could not relate to Bill Friday. And they did not get along, if you can imagine somebody not being able to get along with President Friday, and, and he's not much more, Stu, than just a, an asterisk or a, a footnote here. He did not pick up the gauntlet about the speaker bad law, but Bill Friday did. And knowing Bill Friday, he worked very quietly, very solidly with student leaders. Not so much those who were here when we were here, or even the year after we were here, but later, particularly Paul Dixon. And there was a lot of things that happened and suits went back and forth, and Dr. Friday decided that the best thing would be to have this decided in a federal lawsuit. Lots of things happened after we left. You may know about that, even though it started with three readings in the legislature done in five minutes. It went on and on for a number of years, and then finally, in a few years later, in 65, when most of us were long gone, except those of you who were in law school, med school, and whatever, the Brit Commission was established to study the whole thing. In February 19, 1968, it was overturned. And then finally, remember this was enacted in 1963, March 17, 1995. The whole thing was repealed. 1963, 1995. Now, J.B.S. Haldane, a gen geneticist, was the first victim of the speaker ban law, and the Charlotte Observer reported that. There were others who couldn't come. It did have a chilling effect upon the university, upon Chapel Hill, upon Bill Acock, upon Bill Friday. It still is studied from time to time. It will go down, truly, as an irresponsible piece of legislation. But it will also go down as an opportunity where the university faculty and administrators 
and the president of the university shone brightly so that we can gather in this place today and never be afraid of hearing anyone who espouses anything because we have been taught at this place the power of the intellect and we can counter anybody who comes to spout out whatever they want to do because we believe that is what a university is supposed to be about. God bless the memory of Bill Friday. God bless the continuing existence of Bill Acock. And God bless all those who stood tall to overcome the Speaker Van Law. I did. And I made a lot of friends who, white friends, who are friends to this very day. But I felt that I should make some broad change on the campus. And that didn't happen, of course. And that was ridiculous anyway. But also, I was under the impression that I was going to uh, eradicate poverty, <laughs> racism, <laughs> famine, pestilence, <laughs> through the written word. It took me about a half a year to figure out that's not going to happen, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I'm going to talk about strange things, I'm not going to talk about being arrested or any of that stuff. I'm going to talk about some strange things that happen on the campus that students today would absolutely not believe. When I was arrested, I was out of the dorm. Now, back in those days, you had to be in the dorm on weeknight by 10.30, I think it was. You walked in, they locked the door behind everybody, and then they unlocked the door about 7 o'clock and you'd come out. <laughs> and if you were late or you failed to show up, there were some dire consequences. So when I got arrested and was in jail overnight, I obviously was not in the dorm. <laughs> and of course, the Women's Honor Council had to deal with that. And um, this, this is what I wrote about it. This is my journal. The library likes to call it a diary, but I like to call it a journal. And it is online in Wilson Library. I have been summoned before the Women's Honor Council on a 15-hour lateness charge for my December 19th arrest. I appeared before the council last Thursday. It was a real scream and ended in a mistrial. The council kept, the uh, three girls kept insisting that civil rights kept out of my lateness thing. They said they would treat it as irregular lateness. Now, my idea about that was, you knew where I was. <laughs> and I wasn't exactly out having a good time. <laughs> and, and I called the dorm and told them I wasn't coming in. <laughs> And I did all the things I was supposed to do. So uh, it was a very sticky issue for them. And the civil rights thing was, was sort of uh, barreling along at that time. And they felt they had to kind of keep that in mind. 
So this is what's happened. They called it a mistrial due to inadequate, inadequate procedure and lack of communication between the Attorney General, the investigator, and the defense counsel. And things just sort of disappeared. Nobody ever talked about it again. <laughs> and another crazy thing that happened in my first year, um, I was in West Cobb dorm. And I thought there was an extra bed in my room, and I expected a roommate to show up. And after two weeks, no roommate showed up. I figured no one was not coming. And um, I ran into uh, a girl named Joanne Johnson, and I knew her up at WC. I transferred down from WC, Women's College in Greensboro. And she was in a squeezed into a room with three, three girls in a room. And she said, what the heck? I'm moving in with you. I know you. We're both journalism majors, got a lot of things in common, and she did. Well, everything was kind of cool until her parents came to visit one day, <laughs> and that she introduced her roommate, and all hell broke loose at that point. <laughs> and they went to the university and the dean of women and everything, and said, oh my goodness, you gotta do something about this. Uh, legally, they could not do a lot. They couldn't make a move out, but they did punish her by campusing her. And this is what that punishment was. She could go to class, she could go to the dining hall, but she could not go anywhere off campus for two weeks. That was her punishment. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of um, crazy, silly stuff that went on then. I knew these two guys from the demonstration, <coughs> known them for a while. I'm not going to talk about much more. I'm going to let you ask questions because I got, you know, it's a whole lot of stuff here. <laughs> and I've forgotten probably three quarters of it. So <laughs> I'm going to sit down now and um, let Jim take over. By the way, if you come down, the photograph that I'm standing next to of a police officer dragging a white woman away from Brady's restaurant, the white woman is Joanne Johnson. Yeah. She must have gotten off campus or something. <laughs> um, I showed up at Chapel Hill my freshman year because I wanted to go into what was then called RTBMP. Excuse me. And I stopped by the Daily Tower Hill one day and never left. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Gardley was at the end of his editorship, uh, but it was Wayne King who first sent me out to photograph the Civil Rights Movement. And the Tower Hill editorially uh, did a lot of coverage of that movement. Wayne, followed by Jim Felter and Chuck Rye, followed by uh, Gary Blanchard, who couldn't make it today. The basic premise said that if we had black students like Karen, there were students in law school and in other schools who could not walk across Franklin Street and eat in any restaurant or go to a movie, that that was something that the student newspaper should be interested in. And so Wayne came, sent me out to take photographs of what was happening in the streets. Um, I want to point out, by the way, that we're nice enough to set up outside. Two years ago, I, um, after I retired from the Smithsonian, I had a 
exhibit of these photographs and a few more at the National Press Club in Washington. And a friend of mine saw it and put me in touch with Dover Publishing and we did a book uh, which came out called um, Courage in the Moment. Um, they originally, oh, thank you. They, they originally um, thought that Courage in the Moment was the guy had the courage to take the photographs. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was the courage of the people who were out there putting themselves on the line. I mean, when you think about it, you can go to the March on Washington and you can protest. It's vastly different to be a couple blocks from home or to be in your own hometown and be willing to be arrested. And I want you to notice something about many of these photographs. You will see that they have students, and lots of students from the local high school. Uh, most of the marches began up at St. Joseph's CME Church, which is still very active in their community. Um, but you see students, uh, you see women, and you see older men. Because various places, including the Carolina Inn, by the way, had told black employees that if they participated in the civil rights movement, they would lose their jobs. And so when you, when you look at some of the photographs, you will note that um, the uh, students, both white and black, and let me and, and let me point out uh, a couple of things. It was interesting because, for whatever reason, and I didn't find out until I published the book, there was a police detective who let me inside the line. And in fact, this photograph was taken inside the garage at the old Chapel Hill uh, police station. Uh, his name is Lindy Pendergrass. He later became sheriff of Orange County. And uh, I, I, I would follow them all around. Well, what I didn't know for a while was, first off, Chief Blake. Lindy tells me, when he briefed his folks during all of the sit-ins and all of the arrests, he said, I want you to remember that you're going to know most of the people you're arresting. And after this is all over with, you're still going to have to live with them. And so there was no violence like you saw in Montgomery and Selma and other places. There were some unfortunate incidents outside of town. Lots of restaurants were being owned. Um, but, um, by the way, the photograph showing that policeman, Joe Joanne Johnson, by one arm, after Chief Blake saw that, Lindy tells me now, he told his staff that he didn't want to see any more of that. He wanted two officers to carry each person and not to drag anybody across. And so, if nothing else, I know that my photographs did do something <laughs> to change. The, um, <clears throat> it was also interesting that you can see in some of these photographs that there was a black police officer who was doing some of the arrests. And that was unusual in the South. What the demonstrators wanted was a public accommodations law. They weren't talking about voting, they weren't talking about housing, they weren't talking about anything except being able to go to a restaurant and eat. In the end, it never passed. And it was not until the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 was signed by Lyndon Johnson that that took place. And so many of the people who were active in the demonstrations here felt like they had failed. 
And when I was getting ready to do my book, I had just retired from the Smithsonian and a friend of mine, Lonnie Bunch, is the now founding director of the Smithsonian's newest museum, which is coming out of the ground as we speak. And it's the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It has such interesting things as railway car divided black and white. And And when I told Lonnie that story, he said, tell them they're wrong. He said, what happened was that in the South, after Greensboro, after the sit-in at, at, at Woolworths Counter, and by the way, the Smithsonian has two of those stools on display, so that after that, small movements grew up throughout the South. Chapel Hill and other places. And that over time they came together. And over time they came together to the point where there was the March on Washington in 1963. And it was after that march that President Johnson signed the bill in 1964. So he said, tell them that if they hadn't been part of these small groups that did individual protests, such as the ones, such as the ones in Chapel Hill, that that would probably have never happened. And so if you happen to have been around at that time, I, I, I pass that on. Um, I have talked to, by the way, it, um, the Alumni Association has very nicely set up a booth out front if you're interested in, in uh, buying, buying one of my books. Um, but um, when we were getting ready to print, my wife and I came down to St. Joseph's Church where the march had started in many cases. And they had an open house for us and we put up eight by 10 prints on the wall and members of their parent, their parishioners and, and uh, Baptist Church, which was across, is across the street, came in and circled faces and gave me names. And so where you see names in the book, that's how I got it. I then went out and talked to Lindy, and he gave me the names of the police officers. And um, that's how we ended up uh, being able to do that. Uh, there's a couple of other photographs that I want to point out. Because of what I was doing, I had a, a great point average that wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> I had a C average the first semester of my freshman year and didn't get it back until the day I graduated. <laughs> From summer school, second session. <laughs> I worked on the summer tar deal. We lived together in a place that hopefully has been condemned. <laughs> <laughs> out on the airport road somewhere. And um, we got a news release from the Ku Klux Klan. Because they're having a recruiting rally. Out of the road to Hillsboro 86 or where it crosses the interstate. And, and it's a recruiting rally, and so uh, Mickey and I went. I mean, they had noted that the state police were going to be taking care of parking and traffic, if you thought that. Well, what could happen? <laughs> and uh, when we got there, there were guys in uniform who were uh, directing traffic. Turns out when we got out of the car, uh, they, they, were, they were Klansmen. In, in uniforms. I swear they were wearing brown shirts. Um, I think I got away with taking the photographs because they wanted to know who we were. We identified ourselves. And I think when I told them that my name was Jim Wallace, <laughs> 
that they thought I was related to the then governor of Alabama. <laughs> uh, I am not. <laughs> and, and I was told so in person by George Wallace. <laughs> but follow, following his speech, he did. Um, but uh, Mickey and I, it, it's the only time, and I, I told somebody a little bit earlier, it's only one or twice that I have ever been scared taking photographs. Uh, one was this night, and the other was in Washington, D.C. on Constitution <coughs> Avenue during a Redskin victory parade when somebody in the crowd pushed me in front of a bus. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out a couple of other photographs. You'll note here that this is an older woman holding a sign in the march. Uh, you will note here that, that and this was taken in front of a uh, colonial drugstore. That it is that it is uh, children. One of the one of the big days when they tried to shut down Chapel Hill and did a pretty good job of it. Um, the Lake Forest basketball game. This picture was taken at uh, the exit to the parking lot, and so when the game was over, all of the parking lots were blocked by people sitting in, and nobody could leave. And there was a lot of people yelling and screaming. Uh, this picture was taken at Watts Restaurant. This was, this was not the, the night of the incident, but uh, it was reported in the Tar Heel that uh, a, a photographer was jostled. <coughs> and I'll be quite honest with you, I got one, one shot off and was told to leave and I was outnumbered. <coughs> the, the woman with the flag was our summer papers Fourth of July photograph. And so uh, rather than photographing picnics and ball games and whatever, uh, we photographed a, a march. And if you look at the photograph, uh, it is the woman, the flag, and it says, uh, stand up. I think it was all in innocence. It has come to my attention, B. Long said, that you have been seen walking across campus with an African-American girl. He didn't say African-American because that was not the term. I think that that had to have been done out of great concern for me by Dean Long. But I was absolutely flabbergasted at that. And, you know, not in my wildest imagination can I imagine anything like that happening today. I thought I was going, because I knew him fairly well <clears throat> by covering a lot of things in administration, and I thought he was going to be saying something about whatever. But he was concerned about the fact that I had been seen walking across campus with Karen. I waited a long time before I told her that, 1988. I only share it because I truly believe that Dean Long was just trying to say that there are elements on the campus which might not respond favorably to a, a white guy and a black girl walking across campus. I was very naive, and in many ways I still am, didn't see anything wrong with that, but now that I look back on it, I can understand how unusual that was. How it came to the attention of the Dean of Men, I'll never know. But that is what happened. Now, I will also say that Karen became kind of like a little sister to me because we were both in J school, and she still is. We're still very, very good friends. We uh, correspond a lot, we talk a lot, we take each other out on our birthdays, she's close to my wife, we provide advice and counsel. That started in 1963 and 64. Same with Jim Wallace. You know, going out on these civil rights demonstrations night after night after night, including one night before final exams, when Jim and I went to Greensboro to watch the big march led by Jesse Jackson. That's another reason that Jim and I had to spend an extra semester here <laughs> in North Carolina. But I wanted you to know what happened when Karen and I 
for walking across the campus in 1964. But I figure after 50 years, the, uh, what do you call it, the thing of uh, Statue of Limitations has expired. We have some questions. Well, I'm inspired by this uh, panel for a partial confessional. I grew up in Atlanta. When I was 12 years old, I got on a bus downtown, and the only seat in the white section of the bus, which was about three quarters of the bus, was on an aisle. I sat down. And shortly thereafter, an elderly black lady got on, laden with shopping bags. And every instinct I had was to get up and let this lady sit down. And I said to myself, if I do that, I'm violating the law and I could get arrested. She'd be violating the law and she might get arrested. I didn't have the courage that you had, and so I sat. During that time, growing up in the Jewish community in Atlanta, only one rabbi had the courage to speak out on civil rights, only one, not in my synagogue, Rabbi Rothschild of the temple. The Klan bombed the temple, and if any of you remember the play and movie Driving Miss Daisy about the temple bombing, written by Alfred Jury from North Carolina, it was about the reaction to Rabbi Rothschild. So that's what I came to Chapel Hill with. I accepted segregation as a given. 1962, at the ZBT fraternity, on Sundays, we closed for meals. And so this particular Sunday, I was driven by a fraternity brother from New York to Hojo's, Howard Johnson's, on Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. We got out of our car, and there were a group of black students from North Carolina Central sitting in, blocking the access. Now, mind you, 1962, I'm already a sophomore, and I said naively, why are they doing that? And he said, where are you living? What do you mean, why are they doing that? They can't be served here. And it was like someone lifted a veil. I became active in the voluntary desegregation of restaurants in Chapel Hill. But an incident, very important, I don't know if you reported it, Mickey. Frank Porter Graham, the great president of the University of North Carolina, then former president, spoke at Memorial Hall, right in the middle of all this. A student got up and said, President Graham, isn't it true that these civil rights demonstrations come from Moscow? <laughs> he said, young man, they don't come from Moscow, they come from Greensboro. <laughs> very, very compelling statement. Years later, when I was President Carter's chief domestic advisor, remembering this and being inspired by what happened and my own tone deafness for so long. When the Bakke case came before the Supreme Court, we were asked uh, for our brief. I worked with Vice President Mondale and Joe Califano, and we overturned the original draft of the Justice Department's brief, which would have had the administration intervene on behalf of the white student claiming reverse discrimination. And that Bakke decision, five to four, following the brief we finally filed, supporting affirmative action, has lasted really to this day, even with some of the reversals. Last point, and a particularly pointed one, about Bill Friday. Bill Friday had not only been a champion on the speaker band, but on desegregation. And during our administration, the Department of what was then called Health, Education, and Welfare brought a suit against the University of North Carolina on the ground that they had not sufficiently desegregated the system. Bill Friday came to see me many times. It was extraordinarily painful for him, having put so much into this, to be threatened with a suit. In the end, it was settled. 
but it was a particularly <coughs> poignant moment at one of the more difficult parts of, of Bill's tenure. He was a great man, as was Bill Aycock, and we all are indebted to them. But I just wanted to put you back into this era because these are people who had much more courage than I did. So I signed petitions after this Hojo's incident about desegregation, but I wasn't willing to risk my life or to be arrested because of what it might have on my career. And so you all really give us an inspiration, but I wanted you to know when you say, was it all for naught, when you look at Baki and what we were able to do afterward, that what we learned here in Chapel Hill had a lasting impact on me and I think on uh, public policy in the United States of America. Most of us at the Tar Heel ate at a restaurant called Harry's. Harry, Harry's was just across Franklin Street next to the post office that is, that is now a courthouse. And it was one of the few fully integrated, not to mention a wonderful place to get a pastrami sandwich. <laughs> and the Tar Heel staff ate there regularly, as did the leadership of some of the marches. And so after a while, they would let us know where they were going to be sitting in. Uh, they had a couple of things in mind. Num number one, um, they did not want the police to be there when they arrived, but they didn't want to be there by themselves very long. <laughs> and having somebody out there with a camera and flash gun going off sort of could calm things down. And so after the book came out, I asked Wendy, I said, why did you let me have all of that access? And he said, we knew that you knew where they were going, and so I followed you. <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was a book put out called 27 Views of Chapel Hill, and I wrote an essay about uh, the demonstrations, and we thought we had a mole, you know, that was telling the police where we were going. <laughs> so when we had the, the is this thing working? Yeah. When we had the, the big demonstrations, the ones that blocked uh, the Wake Forest game, they didn't even tell us where we were going. We got deposited, and I was sitting in the middle of Franklin and Columbia. And boy, I was glad when they arrested me. <laughs> I don't want to put you folks on the spot in a way, yes, in a way I do. I'm concerned about the present, and I'm concerned about the coziness of university administration with commercial interests. I wonder if the current administration has the intellectual fiber that uh, President Friday and Bill Aycock had, if they would stand up for these issues today. I wonder what you think about that. Chancellor, Chancellor Fult is on the sexual assault committee working with Ob President Obama. So yes, they are engaged. Uh, my question to Mickey though is, 
Can you elaborate on Paul Dixon and Philip Aftaker and what went on that day at the wall? Well, that was after my time, but it was a courageous thing for him to do that with Herbert Aft and, and Frank Wilkinson. Uh, that at one time was actually called the Governor Dan Moore Wall out there. And one of our colleagues, a guy named Jock Larderer, uh, was covering that in photographic evidence. And then one of my radio buddies, Bill Walker, is in that iconic picture holding out a microphone. That took enormous courage. And then I had in my notes here that there was a, a time of dedication on October 12, 2011, of the marker at McCorkle Place particularly saluting the student leaders who really got in there and showed what they were made of. And when I said God bless the memory of Bill Friday, I should have added God bless the memory of Paul Dixon too. That guy really did stand tall. Does that help? I have a question. I think I speak for most everybody here that sort of like what Stu was saying, we came here naive about the whole situation and these sit-ins opened our eyes in one way or another. I'm curious, Karen, what you can say about the young people today who didn't experience that and how long it's taken for us to spread what we learned here out to the rest of the community and whether we've made any progress or not. The young people today, most of them, they know very little about it. Um, a few years ago, the uh, alumni review did uh, all, practically a whole issue on the civil rights demonstrations in Chapel Hill. And one thing uh, that was found out then, well, a lot of people didn't know there were civil rights demonstrations in Chapel Hill. And they were clue. So, um, I guess someone might have been on campus at the time, I don't know, and, and otherwise engaged. When I talk to students, and I, I often do, I'll come, sometimes come down here and talk to class and tell them about what was going on then. They pretty much just absolutely don't believe it. It is just beyond anything, you know, they can grasp. I, I talked to them about the segregation one time and I put it on the, the real level. And I said, suppose you're going down to see Aunt Chile in Florida, you're driving down and you get uh, hungry and you better have something in the car, or you're going to stay hungry, or you go to the grocery store. We, we, people brought their own food in the car. Uh, you need to go to the bathroom, there's the woods. Uh, you got tired, you slept in the car. And students just don't, they, they really couldn't believe that. It, but that's the way it was back then. I think it's very important to tell students and, and other young people today about what happened uh, so this legacy is, is, is not lost. One of the things that, that I would like to add is that when we were at St. Joseph's Church getting the names of people in my photographs, um, a, a younger, uh, man came up and I said, younger, he was under 50. <laughs> and uh, the definitions change over time. Uh, but anyway, he came up to one of the older women who were sitting there looking through the photographs. And he looked at her and he said, what did you do during the struggle, Mama? Uh, frankly, that's where I got the subtitle, the, the, the Civil Rights Struggle instead of the Civil Rights Movement. But, one of the things that the Jackson Center up at St. Joseph's is doing is using these photographs and other resources to both do oral histories of the people from the church who participated, but in addition, bring in kids in high school and junior high school uh, to show them what their parents and grandparents did so that they can go out and um, Howard Johnson ain't there anymore, but to any of the restaurants in Chapel Hill. Jimmy, that question, I just hear. Uh, just a, a comment. Mickey Blackwell and I shared a floor in Old Langham Dorm uh, for a couple of years. And I remember an incident, you're talking about how faculty was involved. 
uh, a couple of the uh, uh, residents up on second floor of Mangum were going to a movie one night. And uh, one of them is now my brother-in-law. And uh, they were going down to the varsity. Both of them were enrolled in the beginning physics course. And who was out there picketing but big, tall, impressive Professor Straley. They took one step toward the movie and turned around and I looked back about 10 minutes later and they were back on the dorm floor. And I said, that was a quick movie. They said, uh, we decided not to go. <laughs> So I was just going to echo um, your comments about students on campus not knowing the history of Carolina and particularly the civil rights movement. So the only, I know about Chapel Hill's civil rights history because both of my parents are very intentional about making sure that I'm aware of my history as well as the history surrounding us in North Carolina. And my dad got a full ride to go to Carolina but did not go because of a lot of the things that were going on at the time. And he decided that he wanted to go out of state instead. But it's remarkable to hear how students are not aware of how segregation happened on this campus. And they're not aware that you know, slaves at one time were on this campus. And we have a lot of pride in Carolina tradition and history, but sometimes we choose to selectively honor different parts of our history. And this session is probably the first session in my three years um, at Carolina where I've been exposed directly to some of the history that's very vital in me being where I am today and a lot of my fellow students as well. And I also wanted to say, just hearing you say the comment about walking across campus as a white male and you as a, a black female is hilarious because I'm the vice president of our class and the president, who's one of my best friends, is this six six white guy and we walk on campus all the time. And just to think about how at one time our existence and who we are as um, two leaders would have been frowned upon or would have been seen as taboo is just phenomenal. Yeah, we find it hilarious too. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you called into the dean's office about doing that. Wow. If it had been a black man and, and a white woman, a uh, different matter, he probably would have been lynched on the spot. Right. Well, I appreciate it's that. It's funny you use the word lynch because I was talking to some of my uh, fellow students, and one of them said, I didn't even know that lynching was a thing until I got to college. So I didn't even know what lynching was. And so that's the, the way that history has been lost in translation, the way that civil rights has been miscommunicated or underrepresented is crazy. You guys would not believe how unaware my classmates are of some of the things that you guys went through. Let me make this real quick, but uh, if you all know when you get our age, what you want to do is pass on your genetic information and your family information to your children so that they will know who, that where they came from, et cetera, et cetera. We are lucky now with computers and all this analysis with DNA. Um, and I recently had my DNA done on 23andMe, uh, which is a California company. And, they have a program where you can match your DNA with everyone in the country if you wish, or you can keep it private, whatever you want to do. And we like to just say, well, where did we come from? Uh, and we have these also by computer, you can get your family trees, pass that on to your children. When I got mine back, uh, I found out, uh, and we're all from the South, so we know a lot of us who came here to North Carolina, I found out that a part of my genome is sub-Saharan African. So, hello cousin. <laughs> Fear that those kind of leaders of real Friday, of what our leaders today will continue to.
It's important that they know this history to continue to be the champions that Franklin was about, about, uh, about education today. Well, I was talking about Franklin McCain, who was one of the uh, February 1st, 1960 demonstrators from a and who went into Woolworths. And if you ever think about it, that was our senior year in high school. If you heard about that, you were one of the few people that heard about it. We didn't know about that happening our senior year in high school, but that's when that happened. They went out, and Franklin McCain, until basically the day he died, was a great inspiration about that. I find it hard to believe that you didn't know anything about that. I, I, I remember, of course, in my high school, I was a junior in high school, uh, the word filtered in, and I mean, we were just beyond belief that any black people had the nerve to subject themselves to that. And and of course, they, these people are very admired to the state, but that inspired our students and a lot of the college students in Winston-Salem to go out and do the same thing. You were in Winston-Salem, that took place in Greensboro, it just didn't make it down to Gastonia. <laughs> Where I was, literally, it just didn't make it. Um, you started off your story on June 24th, June 25th, and there's these three guys who are very concerned. What were they concerned about to that degree that was going on here that made them gather that evening? And to what extent was the student body aware of what those concerns were? Or when this came out, was it just like out of the blue? Yeah, it was out of the blue. There was, uh, there was no uh, knowledge that anybody had about what was going on. And one of the things that was most concerned about with Phil Godwin and Clarence Stone and Clifton Blue was the fact that the faculty, a lot of the faculty here, they said, they thought, they surmised, were sympathetic to the desegregation movement, sympathetic to the demonstrators. And they had actually seen somebody that they identified as a marcher. And they thought that person may have communist sympath sympathizing going on in his own life, and so that became the impetus. Now, you need to remember that in 1960, and in 1962 and 64, that anybody who was campaigning for office didn't necessarily state it, but if they had to state it, including the governor in 1960 who ran, they had to say, I believe in segregation. That's just the way it was. Now, Terry Sanford was very much opposed to the Speaker Van Law. He just didn't have the veto at that time, or it would not have become law. But they were agitated, and so was the Secretary of State, Thad Ewer, who helped put it together, because they saw somebody named Al Woodstein doing some marching, and they got real concerned about that. Mickey, don't forget the WRAO commentary about the red vest and the of the South. Yeah, the, the first person to come out supporting the Speaker Van Law was Jesse Helms. What did you say that Jesse called it? The Red Festering Sore of the South. Yeah. That was his definition. The Red Festering Sore of the South. And he really was supportive of the Speaker Van Law. Remember when they wanted to build a zoo? Yes. Yeah. Just put a, uh, put, a, put a fence around Chapel Hill. There's your zoo. He, he denied ever saying that. But he did. <laughs> to um, have one last question, only people can stay if they wish. I do want to point out that the alumni luncheon, technically we're out of time, that starts at 12.15. Stay if you wish, we're calling shuttle drivers too for those who need it, but uh, for those who want to stay, and you're willing to take some more questions. And, and oh please, people who, I meant to say this earlier, anyone who buys the book, Jim's book out front, Please bring it back down. He's happy to sign them. And now, John. Excuse me. Really not a question. Just two brief things. First, uh, get Jim's book. It's, a, it's got great pictures in it. I'm John Brooks, and I had occasion to work on the staff of Terry Sanford in 64 and uh, had the privilege of putting together a book or report for mayor, the mayor of Charlotte, Mayor Brookshire and his commission on the reaction of the administration to the civil rights movement is called North Carolina and the Negro. 
co-authored with General Capus Wainick of High Point, a former editor of the High Point Enterprise. And I want to thank this gentleman for furnishing about 60% of the photographs that are in that report. You may not remember us getting the permission, but we actually got written permission to use the photographs that we had collected. Many of these are in that report as well. It reports on what happened in each community. The other thing I just want to fill in on the speaker ban law, uh, at the Sir Walter Hotel with these other gentlemen, was someone who was there every day named Secretary of State Thad Ewer. He sat in the lobby and he knew every legislature. But back then, there wasn't quite the division between the executive and the, and the uh, legislative bodies. The legislature had zero staff, had no staff budget. The Institute of Government of Chapel Hill furnished the staff of the legislature. And the reading, the uh, staff otherwise just during the session, the enrolling clerk who enrolled legislation passed by the legislature was furnished by the Secretary of State. So the mechanics aspect, and I'm always interested in the, the procedure. The question is, how could you get something through the legislature in a day when there are rules about layover from one house to the other? In fact, bills had to be typed and retyped after amendments and so forth, and the enrolling clerk had to triple space on legal size paper, whatever the legislature, the House did, and then send a version to the Senate and so forth. That took a while, even for a four page bill or whatever. And uh, you couldn't pass it from one house to the other in five minutes. So what was the technique? Thad, you agreed to take the handwritten copy and have the final versions typed up before they were introduced. And so in fact, it didn't take any time after the House passed it to get it to the Senate. They already had typed it up and it was ready to go and the final version was already to be taken down to the governor for a possible signature. All of that was predetermined. Now, what I discovered, I happened to be employed as the first employee of the North Carolina General Assembly in its history. And I was employed as the administrative officer. And I inherited the desk of the enrolling clerk when I got there. That was the only desk available that the staff had at that time. They hadn't spent any, there was no budget, no money had been spent on furniture and I got the enrolling clerk's desk and I went about cleaning it out. The drawers, there were all kinds of papers and I pulled out all the drawers and when I got the drawers out and was cleaning them, I saw there was some more paper down under the bottom, where the bottom drawer had been in the desk and I began pulling that out. There was the handwritten copy of the speaker's band law under that bottom drawer. And, and, and then I knew what the real story was of how they expedited this procedure at the legislature. I would like to make one, one more point, and that is that in the trials that were held in Hillsboro for all the folks who were arrested, during the trials, uh, Gary Blanchard, who was unable to make it here today, um, Gary wrote an editorial uh, that the judge didn't care for. <laughs> and when Gary showed up in the audience at, at, at the court, uh, the judge uh, read, or had Gary read, I forget which. And after the uh, editorial in the Tar Heel was read, uh, Gary was cited for contempt of court. <laughs> you know anything about the show, I'm sure. uh, And uh, we had to hire an attorney, and, uh, and uh, it, 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 of course, never went any further. Although I think Gary still owes me 10 bucks <laughs> for his attorney. Okay, please, let's get.
give our panelists another round of applause.